what we're going to talk about today, and the most important thing that you can do is ask questions. Um, but we all bring a different approach to what happens with a theater organ, and you know it's a it's an interesting instrument. It, it you know by now you know all the basics. You know it makes a bunch of different sounds, um, but depending on how the person wants to sit down and approach it, it can be musically representative of any number of different uh, eras and different styles of music. Because of when I started playing, because of, I think, geographically where I lived, and because of my early musical influences, I gravitated towards a very traditional style of playing. And, it's, and that doesn't mean that I can only play a ballad that was written before 1923. That's not the case. But I mean by a more traditional, melodic, lyrical, uh, harm certain kind of harmonic thinking approach to how I look at any piece of music, even um, whether it's Sondheim or, or uh, something newer. And it's because my early uh, influences that I was lucky enough to mentor with and, and work with some and just absorb from. And, and then in some cases, uh, had the great fun of developing friendship with a number of who I considered really, really top-notch musicians. Um, my four main influences for playing the organ were pretty diverse. They weren't all theater organ, but it was uh, George Wright in Southern California, uh, Richard Elsasser, who was a, a classical organist on the West Coast uh, and, a, and a brilliant uh, performer, incredible talent, um, and Richard Purvis in San Francisco, who was a very romantic classical organist, but who had great ear and sense of color and style and uh, shape and how you, know, how you put a piece of music together. Purvis had no discrimination between uh, that you should place, you should learn something just as carefully and accurately, whether it was a, a, a piece by J.S. Bach, whether it was a French Romantic piece by, by Vierne or, or Vidor, or whether it was a ballad by Jerome Kern or George Gershwin. He used exactly the same approach and the same care. And so that was a great influence. And my fourth influence had nothing to do with theater organ, but it was Virgil Fox, and who became a really good friend. And it seems like a disparate group of people. And yet there were threads that went through all four of those. And I noticed that when they would individually, when we would talk about something, I kept noticing these same items you know, being talked about. One of the important things are what I kind of realized that I boiled down to what I call the four C's. And they're just as applicable to Dave Brubeck as they are to Henry Mancini, as they are to Stephen Sondheim, as they are to Lady Gaga, believe it or not. Uh, and that's the things that I call color and contrast and continuity and cleanliness. Um, they work together, they're not all, it's not like you just think about one and then you know, throw the other three out the window. But uh, by color, I mean the fact that, okay, whether it's this or whether it's a, a, a combo, there, it's nice if after 16 measures of the body of a certain piece of music has been just with some sound, even if it's you know lead guitar with no vocal and uh, second guitar and drums, if then something is going to happen for the next 16 measures, okay, maybe it's the one lead guitar drops out and it's a vocal and some other a slight difference in the accompaniment. Something to come up with different colors. It's like my, my demonstration is if there's a piece of music that is um, seven minutes long. We won't sit through seven minutes, but okay, pretend that this piece is seven minutes long. And here's the introduction. Uh, okay. Okay. 
here is uh, the introduction and and then here's the start of the first part of it. And the song has a bridge. Okay, now four more minutes have gone by, and now you've listened all the way through to where it's got even more exciting because it's changed keys and it's in the fourth chorus, and it sounds like this. I think you see what I mean. <laughs> well, a, maybe, maybe that color happens to be one of your favorites, and it was very nice in the first eight measures. But by seven minutes longer, most people have kind of dialed out, and they're going, Ugh. and so there, there's that problem. That's what I mean by color. The, the shape of it, it, it's a hard term, because there's so much of and this is something that I admire so much about Mr. Eddington, is that so much of what I do is sensory and by intuition. And that's a hard way to do it, not for me, but it's a hard way when it comes to try to explaining it to somebody else. Because I'm not much of a left brain linear person. I don't, I don't think in flow charts and in yellow tablets and all that. Mr. Eddington has that wonderful ability to just constantly switch between both sides of his brain. So he can sense something intuitively, come up with an idea, but he also knows how to go to that other part of his brain to put it into very understandable terms to explain it so that you can go, oh, that's not only how you do that, but that's kind of why that works. I, that's a talent that I really admire because it's, it's difficult for me. So by color, I mean, just that variety of what is it you're going to hear. And, and in this instrument, it happens to come from registration, obviously, so that there's not just one thing constantly. Contrast uh, is really kind of, color and contrast kind of go together for me. And that's why you could do different colors. For instance, out at the, out at the house, you know, we have, my heavens, I think 26 ranks of strings. And you could say, well, I'm, I'm doing color because I'm playing four measures on that pair of strings. Then I'm playing four measures on that pair of strings. And you can do that, you know, 14, 13 times. Well, technically, you are changing something. But that's what I mean by contrast. OK, that's a very thin sound. There's not much fundamental in it. And so you're comparing apples to apples to apples all the way along. I like the contrast of something that goes from a very round, warm sound uh, to something that is totally different. And even with tremulance and without tremulance, uh, so that maybe there is uh, even this. Uh, let's see. <laughs> So if, if you heard there's very, very wide differences in harmonic content, uh, pitch, uh, amount of movement of you know what something's doing on a tremulet. 
So that's, that's what I mean basically by color and contrast. Continuity is a really, really important element to me. And it's not really, uh, I don't think that, it, that it's something that's only important in kind of a traditional approach style like I, I do. I think it's important in, in almost any kind of playing, whether it's jazz playing or anything else. Um, and let's see. I need a volunteer. I need you to think of something that you're very comfortable with, just without music, because we don't have you don't have any with you, and we don't have time to stop for that. So I I want you to play like a whole a whole chorus of something that you're comfortable with. For this purpose, what I, all I'm going to show you quickly is this for all of you. Don't I don't want you to to worry about stopping and looking at a console that you haven't set up for today. So. Starting with general three, okay, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The grate, the accompaniment, and the pedal all balance, and they're graduated in in volume, in an, in an orderly fashion. So it's three through ten. It's the first two rows here. It sets everything, because um, like I say, I don't want, don't worry so much about that. And they're almost all based on sixteen foot pitch, which means you know don't get down into the mud area down in there, kind of stay from there up, mm -hmm. okay? Because my demonstration right now is not about registration or color, okay? So just from there, yeah, and you've got the right, uh, this thing has a master swell shoe, which you're on, so that's fine. Tell me, tell us what the song is. I'll be that's entertained. Okay. I'm not picking on you, I'm using you for a demonstration. Because most, most of that actually had continuity. By continuity, I mean the start of 
kind of thinking in your mind, okay, within this. By the way, the only other thing that I would mention before it slips my mind, because I only have three cells left that work, uh, is you played that right up to a certain point, which was perfectly good, and you almost started to do an ending, and then you didn't, and that's where the ending should have come. You said all it had to say, and so don't be afraid to stop. <laughs> uh, politicians could learn a lot from that. In the start of some sections, I don't know if you noticed or not, you, I try to make a conscious decision of, okay, I have this registered a certain way because I'm going to play this in triads. So I'm going to play either That's through, okay, that was like through eight. What is that? John, is that eight or 16? <laughs> there's my expert. Um, so, that there's, so that there's a continuity, not, okay, the, what are you going to hear? The first thing you hear is the melody, and you know, okay, that's, that's entertainment. But then you, have, you subtly, when people listen, even especially, and they're not musicians, it's amazing what people's ears pick out that don't know anything. I call it the happy birthday effect, but we'll get into that later. Uh, but there's more of a comfort in listening. Like if you were arranging that for a band and you started out with a trio of saxes and trumpets, you, you wouldn't write two measures with that normally and then have the lower two drop out and then do six measures of single note melody and then go back to that other. That's basically what I mean by continuity. There were a few places where uh, going back and forth between, excuse me, almost a chordal approach, but then sometimes that was breaking just into a single note because you were doing some rhythmic accents with what, what before had been part of what was going on up to that. It's better to keep that. Don't let the frosting get in the way of the cake. Okay, frosting's wonderful, but the cake has got to be there to start with. Uh, and I also know that you, you, know, you didn't have anything set on the upper keyboard, so you couldn't do a, a, a little fill or anything up there. Chords going along through the logical end of eight or 16 measures of a song. And then you switch to something else and, and keep continuity in that for while it's going. If this, if this ended up... Yeah, that's basically single note. Now, in that case, the only reason that you can kind of get away with the accent chord being there on the same manual is that the melody note's on the bottom, so it's at, a, at the lower of the two pitches, which gives it more dominance in the sound. And because the accent, and there's also 16-foot post horn in that registration, and the accent then is, is so staccato that you're just hearing the accent part of it. You're not hearing it as a bunch more of the heavy notes of that same chord coming in up, up, up on the top. So by, that's what I mean basically by continuity, is that, that element of what happens within section to section of a song. And I know none of you were doing it, but I can guarantee you, you've probably heard somebody play uh, something along the lines of this. And on and on. Well, it has always driven me up the wall no matter what instrument it's on. I mean, that, you would just never write that for any kind of a group. It's, 
it just uh, the Australians have a wonderful expression that I learned, God, almost 40 years ago. Uh, they would, we were somewhere at a performance. I was with two musical friends of mine, and somebody did something like that. And I said, that's really kind of unusual, isn't it? And they said, unusual? My God, it's all over the place like a mad lady's breakfast. <laughs> one of my two favorite Australian sayings. I can't tell you the other one. Uh, but it's true. It's like, do you want a note? Do you want it down in this octave? Do you want it up in this octave? What else can we put into that eight measures? So by, and continuity really kind of, I think, it focuses things and it also kind of simplifies, you know, somewhat. So that's a real important one. And the last one of my four C's <laughs> is cleanliness. Um, I have never understood the excuse that I've heard given by playing a song incredibly sloppily uh, or the melody line just being what I call in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like night and day, <laughs> maybe. Um, you don't ever get to use the excuse Gee, was that night and day you were playing? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Cole Porter. Oh, but it was strange. Oh, no, it's my own arrangement. <laughs> you get to have your own arrangement. Oh, now, this is only me. Everybody else probably has some different opinion. But I've, I, by the people who beat me on the head, I was, it was drilled into me that you get to have your own arrangement after you earn that right by playing the song the way it was written the first time. And at least meaning the melody line and cleanly. Uh, and then, I mean, I, I love a lot of, of George Shearing and Dave Brubeck and, and, you know, they'll take off and do all kinds of variations on something. But I think it's a good starting point to sort of establish what was the song in the first place. So that, and by cleanliness, it's that ability to whether something is slow and legato or whether something is uh, a pretty brisk tempo is that connection between your mind, your hand, and the motor rhythm of making it move, that at that particular little moment in time, you want exactly that note on, and equally as important with the time and the tempo is which part of the beat does that note let go of? Because the release is absolutely as, as vitally important as the attack. Of. Well, while we're on the topic sort of, of learning it the way it's written, I'll bring up a little thorny old discussion in theater organ. Should you include the verse? Well, that gets into the, he said, should, should you include the verse? That really gets into the realm of arranging, which, um, it, you know, is a huge topic. I mean, I'll leave that to, to <laughs> bigger minds that have much longer time because that is complicated if the verse is there i don't think it's necessarily should you include the verse like oh this is a you know it's the the, the seven trials of sinbad you know i don't want to do it but you know somebody said i have to play the verse i look at it as if you've played through the the body of a song and you've started with the the uh, uh chorus of it it can get a little dull to just play the same song three choruses in a row, even if maybe you change keys during the thing. So I always like to look back and see, did the song also have a, at least an interesting verse or a pretty verse? And oftentimes the verses were written with contrast. There's any number of times, you'll, the one printed thing we have today, it's a very pretty, very plaintive melody. It's an E minor. It's very dark and it's supposed to sound like all the suffering of Russia. Uh, and the verse of the piece is like this wonderful bright sunlight day that's in E major. So the verse makes such a wonderful contrast, you know, to use as, and that's part of the whole thing with contrast and color too, is that, that I, think, I think that the verses are, are, I mean, usually the composer had some reason for wanting it there. Uh, and I think anybody who has a little bit of music published gets a little different thought about that is, you know, we would like to think that somebody at least looks at the whole thing. Okay, maybe you don't like it. That's your right. You know, if you've bought the book, then leave the part out you don't like. But you'd like to at least think, well, give it a look, though, or give it a try. You know, maybe it's pretty. Uh, hmm? Sometimes they just don't fit into an arrangement. 
Well, now that's interesting. Sometimes they just don't fit. <laughs> if you sat down and, and discussed that with Mr. Gershwin, he might have an argument with you about, well, maybe you just haven't figured out where it fits yet. <laughs> I know what you mean, and it depends on, on where, how they're written, how they're going to fit in. Uh, but the, the thing about, about uh, cleanliness is, and playing something the way it's done, is just part, to me, it's part of the respect for music. And I don't, once again, it doesn't matter whether you're playing anything in a very traditional way, whether you're playing anything in a very light uh, contemporary way, in a 50s or 60s jazz type influenced way. I still don't want to hear a whole bunch of half steps adjoining notes and mush and gunk in the music. That's, to me, that's only an indication there's certainly, it's nothing to do with an arrangement, and I, I have to think that it simply hasn't been enough preparation. Go back to the drawing board and run through that again. And we all have to do it. There's uh, a wonderful thing that I learned uh, from Virgil Fox years ago, and I've used it the whole rest of my life, and if anybody walks in on you, they would think, oh my God, he's lost his last brain cell and he's gone loopy, we better you know, phone them in in the coats. But I used to play Tiger Reg, a, a certain arrangement of it as an encore piece a lot, um, along with a lot of other things. And I would always practice it, uh, especially like right before a date. I would run through it a couple times every day for four or five days. And the only way I ever played it in my own home to practice was this. The reason being, inside my mind, I've got to know where is the downbeat, where is the third beat, and where's the and. One, and, two, and. The ands are just as important. That the, the attack and the releases, and it's, it's mental memory, it's digital memory, it's kinetic memory of practicing. The tempo for that piece is supposed to be and the only way that'll ever come out cleanly is by practicing it like that. And I know that sounds like a terribly definite statement, but all I can tell you is I tried it both ways. Uh, it's wonderful with, with having youthful enthusiasm and lots of energy and the mindset of, in my own mind, oh Virgil, that's crazy. What could that possibly accomplish? And I would just race through stuff and it would get, you know, eight tenths of it, right? And I finally thought, well, I wonder if that really does work. And I started practicing almost anything that was fingered and detached and running. I used to play fantasy impromptu, and I always rehearsed it. Because the mm, nothing happens on that. But that's one of the most important parts of that line, <laughs> is that, that void, that rest at the first. It can't just ooze and flow like so much wet spaghetti. Ugh. It has to have absolute corners and breaks in, in where the accents come, where the, where the notes attack, where they release. So, and that's all part of, of cleanliness to me. That, that's, that's the simple one-page explanation of the difference between grace notes in old traditional theater organ playing and grace notes in all your classical piano lessons. They are, they are written uh, and notated. Uh, you could write that out with the, the first of those two notes being a grace note to A. But you're still going to hear two notes. What the first person I heard innovate it on early recordings was Jess Crawford and he used the idea of a grace note but he attacked it 
physically at exactly the same time as the note that it was coloring. The difference being it had absolutely no value. Its value was only has it made contact and has, has it made some kind of a sound. The shortest the duration, the better. And what it does then is it becomes like a certain vocal effect that can be done by certain uh, Neapolitan tenors. Um, there are certain uh, cantors and rabbis in synagogues that have a way that can sing with a little break in their voice. Jolson could do it to a certain extent. And the difference when it's connected becomes um, Uh, let's see. There's a big difference in that as opposed to, okay, I really want to make sure that you can hear the difference and you know what I'm talking about. Is that, can you hear that the, 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 it's two whole different musical effects? Good, okay. It's, it's just a matter of, no matter where it's notated, just put it in, in, your, in your timing part of your mind that it's the same as what the melody note is, but that's why it has to be fingered a certain way because it has to just release exactly on whenever that attack is. Okay. So there, now you know everything there is to know about grace notes, <laughs> at least in, in that era. Um, and I just did a big no-no. Thank you, Lou. That and that. Wurlitzer swell shades are not an Aeolian Skinner, and they don't stay open when you turn off the organ or leave the bench. For the courtesy to the next person, close the swell shades and hit the general cancel. Don't do what I just did. If there are any questions so far about all of that tirade about cleanliness and continuity and color and all of that kind of stuff, does, any, does that at least make sense at a logical uh, standpoint? Yeah. Ron Mitchell has been hammering that <laughs> into me lately for the past few months. Well, the continuity thing is, is a real pitfall, especially for a lot of, of beginning players because your brain doesn't really focus that much and, and then all of a sudden you'll be listening to a registration and you'll be playing something in chords but the song makes you come down here because of how the melody goes and so it's then real easy to go well then I'll just let go of all that and play a single melody or kind of even worse I'm, I'm three and a half measures in but I'm getting too low so let's just change measures uh, octaves and jump up an octave and play up here and it's just all very disjointed and pulled apart. Once again, I, in, in arranging, I kind of like to hear the first chorus of something fairly authentically. Uh, there's whole approaches that don't do that. I mean, Dave Brubeck would tell me I was crazy. <laughs> but uh, I, like, I like establishing that before going on to then, because it makes it more interesting of, okay, then what can I do with that? You know? Uh, uh, <laughs> Case in point, a wonderful arrangement that uh, could not possibly have more contrast to it. By the way, T for two with your left hand was the only practice exercise that I was ever given by George Wright. Uh, I used to play terrible second touch, <laughs> honk, honk, blap, blap. And <laughs> he said, well, I can't tell you what he said, but it, in a nicer way, he said, gee, Lynn, that's not very clean. You know, why, 
are you practice? And I said, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I play second touch all the time. And I thought, eh, I really do. Here, there, where, you know, and then it goes away. And it really is the one way to get it very clean is with a keyboard on, on a practice instrument that just has something louder that you can hear than the eight foot concert flute. And that is to just have the accompaniment very, very gentle and to have second touch note loud enough that you can hear. And the third requirement, which he would make me do, is that hand goes under there. <laughs> and on and on. Because what you, what you don't want to hear, and which you will when you're starting, is you don't want to hear this. And it's hard, it's just muscle training. It's just, it's just repetitive muscle training. That's all it is. Um, if you don't already play cleanly on second touch, try sitting on your right hand. It did, I mean, you have to play the organ too, but <laughs> it's not going to do any good to watch television and do that. <laughs> uh, no, it really was invaluable. And, and like many things, it's don't get discouraged that, you know, we live in a society, unfortunately, and, and I, don't, I don't like to do me and you, but I had an advantage in that I lived in a society where everything wasn't instant. Uh, I wasn't always in constant contact with all of my friends in school via my pocket. And so there was really a little more time to devote. People would, would want to learn the, the cello or the violin or something. And they didn't get discouraged because, well, I've taken these lessons for three weeks, you know, and I'm not playing any Fritz Chrysler yet. Nobody looked at anything that way. It was realized that if this is, gonna, you know, to develop something, it's, it's going to be a several year process. So by any little technicality, to me that's just a technicality of theater organ. It's a device that's there. It becomes extremely useful. We'll play an example after lunch uh, of just how much, uh, how useful second touch is. It's almost like having a third arm that, you know, to the listener, well, where's that coming from? But the only way to get used to it is physically, practically having something to practice on that has a second touch keyboard. Um, What's it, what's it called? Velocity sensitive keyboards, like a lot of the electronic keyboards do, uh, do a lot of neat stuff, but it's a totally different thing. It's, it's not muscle control in that. Uh, so it, yeah, it's a, it's a very good little exercise to use. Well, better hard than soft. Uh, soft makes you honk through all the time, and, and they go rap, 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 it's terrible. Um, you know, by, by hard you know, or stiffer, I wish I could tell you that if my friend Al Young was here, he could tell you the, the actual, there's a weight, because I had to come up with something that could be quantified for setting keyboards when we were working on organ projects. And I came up with something that felt pretty good to me and Tom Hazelton and a bunch of us that played. And, and it's been pretty much used as a standard on a lot of the instruments that I've been involved with. Um, and, it's, and it's a certain weight for the first touch so that, so that the key responds quickly enough when you let it go, you know, and yet you're not killing yourself to play it. Uh, second touch, and there's another, another like so many grams of pressure, you know, to make second touch play down to the bottom. I play an awful lot of consoles that the second touch is way too wimpy. And I think it's been given into by people who maybe are, are just beginning players and think, oh, that's terrible. They must have never meant it to be like that. It's pretty hefty. This one's not bad. This one, this one over 13 years has gotten somewhat uneven. And that's just, that's normal with time. But they kept it the way that Barton originally did it. Mm -hmm. 
practice on that and then buy certain t-shirts that'll show off your left bicep because your right arm is going to stay skinny but your left arm is going to be wonderful after a couple of years so yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We end up all like Popeye on one side. I use great second touch sometimes, nowhere near as often as, as accompaniment, but, but sometimes and just for an accent under a chord that no different in writing with, with uh, you know, a bunch of, of reeds and all playing through a song and holding a chord. And then big band writing oftentimes just had an accent note of three trumpets and, and trombone, but right over that same chord, but just going bap, bap. Well, that's what could be easier, you know, if you're already in the right position. Once again, the keyboard has to be adjusted right so you can play cleanly on first touch and not sink down into that other by mistake. Because it's that, and that's the, that's the organ builder's responsibility. <laughs> A lot of places do that. Um, let's see, I'm kind of wondering if I want to, yeah, let's just, let's do, let me do this for you, because this is kind of a bunch of the elements of traditional theater organ, arranging, playing, registration, whatever, uh, are pretty representative in this little excerpt from a Russian lullaby. Uh, Russian lullaby, Gee, I didn't even give the guy credit. Um, I didn't write it. I, I, I wrote out this arrangement, but most of this arrangement is based very much on the uh, Victor recording that Jess Crawford did of Russian Lullaby. Um, early, early 20s, I think. And had to come up with an idea. Okay, here's this piece of music. Okay, say the, the chorus is in minor. Uh, it was actually written during the silent film era. If you, as you listen to the, the chorus, the minor part, you can just imagine uh, something uh, very ominous or like a poor little peasant in a hut out on the plains and they haven't had, you know, bread without mold for three months. Oh, it's very, uh, suffers a lot. So he needed to come up with an introduction for it. And uh, there was also an old, at that time, an old Russian folk song called the Volga Boatmen, which was mediumly well known. And so he used as a little quote of that as the introduction. But the interesting thing about, about this, the, and, and the, the arranging part, like I say, is not, I take no credit for. Uh, this is pretty much all Crawford's ideas. He starts this thing of, of, of the introduction, and you'll hear, and it's these very ponderous and cold sounding minor chords and it and it's e minor and so it's you know dum pum pum dum 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 that's how the volga boatmen go well to kind of catch your ear and and make you have that wonderful feeling that to me in arranging it's when you can get the listener to that point of ooh what happens next I think that's one of, the, one of the most interesting things to be able to do and, and really successful because it keeps, keeps people's ear. So the introduction breaks off totally unresolved. And it goes from that then into the verse, which is in major, and then finally gets back around to the, to the song. Um, and when I wrote this, it was for a much uh, more beginning level workshop. And so... I will probably play, if I'm, I'm used to playing it the original way, so there might be a few more notes in it here and there than you see. Uh, let's see. And is that...
so you can hear the, the difference in, in contrast that, that part at the end of the, of the introduction. I just love the fact that it's, you know, and back then a fair number of people recognized the Volga Boatman. And, but then it gets to tum, 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 da dum, da dum, tum, tum, and it just stops totally unresolved and then settles on that wonderful uh, uh, major you know, chord at the start of the, of the verse. Um, there's another element that is really well demonstrated in this, and that is to keep things moving forward from, um, in a forward direction, kind of pulling the listener along. The verse starts out in E major on an E major chord. So it could, it could have started like this. played the verse that time with all root pedal under every chord name of whatever its chord designation is. It starts out in E major, so it's not wrong to play the opening chord and play the tonic E under it. But here's the one thing that occurred to me, at least a long time ago, and that I heard in this, and, and it made such sense because it kept, it kept me knowing I've got to get it to another measure to know what's going to happen with this piece. Because if a piece starts this way, it's not done. That's an A minor sixth <laughs> chord. That's not wrong. It's the it's something that I think listeners can hear that is really hard to explain, and I certainly can't prove it. But I, I mentioned earlier, and to an absolutely untrained listener, somebody who had never seen a keyboard, didn't know what a dot on a line meant, um, you know, I wish I had a hypothetical somebody I could pick out. They don't count. They all know about organ back there. Uh, but it's what I call the happy birthday effect. Why are you laughing? It's a very, very deep scientific theory. <laughs> I came up with it years ago. Uh, and that's this. You don't have to ever have had a lesson in anything to see what your reaction is. That is, we could stop there. Everything's resolved. All the, all the little loose ends have come back together. It's in the tonic key that it's written in, and it's got root pedal underneath it. It doesn't have to go anywhere. And that's one thing in arranging that I try really hard to avoid. There's a whole, the whole end section of Russian Lullaby. Uh, starting on, 
let's see. Starting on uh, the, the third of the pages, it's got a little ink thing that says 23 on the top. Um, that second system down, second stave down, is the, the start of the end section. And even though it's E minor, Crawford did not start it. Uh, that is the first point out of all of those measures where the E minor tonal bass has an E minor tonic pedal under it. And by doing that, it's just that subtle thing to the, to the listener of, you know, they don't know how to put it into words, but I, I really think most people can get the feeling of, well, that's going to go somewhere, or it's not finished, or what's going to come next. And I think that's something that's really good to try to, to, try to create. Um, is there any, any questions so far about any of that? You're so perceptive. Um, that, that little excerpt is, it's not at all complicated note-wise, I mean, you can see it. And one of the things also that I think is really good just on your own, when you have time to sit and look through, and, it, and it's not something, it's not just, well, it only works in a song written in 1922, it has nothing to do with that. It's, if something is musical, it's musical. But the thing that Crawford was very good at for clarity in an arrangement was you'll notice that in the accompaniment it's not always big three and four and five note massed chords duplicating whatever the pedal note is and also duplicating whatever the melody note is. You know, once, once you've heard it, you know, it's kind of like the pretty girl that walks in a party. You know, she goes through the door, go ooh. Well, you've seen her by then. You know, it's, you don't get to keep going out the door and coming back in again. It's, there's a certain, of, you know, the note's already there. You know, it, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense or not. But th what Crawford was very good at, the, at being sort of sparse or careful was the notes that were there were all adding something to the chord. Okay, you might think, okay, this is a, uh, like a B minor sixth chord, and, and technically it is if, if you based it to that you were playing a B. And a lot of times, uh, if the melody was on B, then the pedal wouldn't be. The pedal might be up on D, the, the third above, and the other two might be putting in the sixth. And so he really tried not to duplicate. Now, there's times that it crosses through and goes through, but, but the, that basic approach is trying to kind of minimalize down to, you know, which are the notes that are really adding some harmony and adding something to the arrangement, and how much of it is, well, I've already got that note here, and I've also got it here in the chord, and it's the melody that I'm on here, and then I'm going to reach up and play a chime note on the same thing. Well, it's kind of much of a muchness. It, you know, I don't really know that it's, that it's adding all that much. So, so it's, it, it's just, it's, it's a way of kind of weeding out a little bit. Justin? <laughs> you have a question about happy birthday. Well, I could just imagine. <laughs> what about, what's your opinion on ending a song on a 13th chord? <laughs> 13th chord? <laughs> Mr. Eddington. <laughs> oh, well, a 
thirteenth chord is a thirteenth chord. No, no, but it's it goes further. Uh, in certain styles of music, um, there's a place for uh, like what I think of as two six chords. Uh, I, I heard a wonderful arrangement very recently with theater organ and percussion, and um, so It was a style of chord writing that, that came about much more starting in the 1950s. Uh, even in 40s, big band swing, there wasn't a whole lot. There was a lot of sixth writing. But that, that doubled up kind of 50s, smoky lounge, uh, bearded drummer in the corner playing away. And uh, <laughs> was something that, that did start then. And, and it's a certain sound. I, we all perceive sound differently, I'm sure. My ear can get more quickly tired of that after, if every measure has it and it's all omnipresent, it's like constantly always adding a sixth to any major chord. Uh, I, d I don't care for it as much. I thought of like, you know, like a, for example, like Fly Me to the Moon. Mm -hmm. Going on up past the 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 tonic C or or hidden down in it. No, just at the very end, just one declamatory thirteenth chord. I hope you got that. I'm very impressed. That's not just a thirteenth chord. That was a declamatory thirteenth chord. Good for you. Now, anything can work as an effect. Uh, done sparsely. I think I think the more complex a sound is, or even like in a register, there's certain registrations that are really interesting and they're really kind of whacked out. They've got, you know, funny uh, little short length reeds wiggling away on trams and one foot in them and all kinds of stuff. And coming from, it's, it's a thinner sound, but I don't want to hear that for 28 measures long. Uh, it's like, stand, my biggest analogy is, uh, I really enjoy food. And so years ago, I also learned how to cook food that I enjoyed. And it would be like standing there, and then I'm going to open up the cupboard, and every one of these little shaker bottles, you know, we're going to have four courses to eat. And every one of them, I'm going to dump three shakes of every spice in that cabinet, you know, on everything that comes out of that frying pan. Uh, it can turn into much of a muchness. So the, it, it gets back to that being a little bit weeded out, being a little bit careful on, you know, don't, don't uh, put everything there all the time. The, the English have an expression that you, you don't put, put all the goods in the shop window at once. And that's, you know, you, you still want customers to come in. You want to have some, something new that's <laughs> shiny for, you know, the next week. Um, it's like using musical devices, whether it's grace notes or chromatic runs or whatever. I don't want to hear that in every measure of every piece through every key change, you know, that you do because it, it just becomes you know, the whole thing is just saturated then. So anything like that, especially the more unusual something is, it can be used as an effect, but just not overdone. I'd kind of gone through that one uh, uh, little example, the, the uh, uh, Crawford arrangement of the Russian lullaby and and I hope through the course of that that you were kind of watching not just the the melody line of song which is the most obvious thing that most people will notice um, but I like to use that example because of all that underlying stuff you know where stuff is placed where the pedal note is in in any given measure the fact that you know, it's like when you can look through that later or, or even like try it on a keyboard, the fact that it's not, you know, huge amounts of notes everywhere, but there's that approach to doing that can work 
for so many other things and in, and in lots of different styles. With playing in lots of different styles, you know, I, I kind of started out and, and developed along one way. Um, I had a, 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 an associate and a friend uh, in the Midwest named John Singh, who, who unfortunately passed away way too young, whose mind thought 180 degrees differently than, than mine does or that somebody else's. And it was absolutely 100% solid musically. It, it worked, you know, stuff was only what needed to be there, but in a whole different uh, way of harmonic thinking, a whole different harmonic sense, a whole different uh, rhythmic approach to things. Um, there was an organist named Billy Nall, who is also, he's not here now anymore, but uh, he had, a, a, yet again, a, a, a very different way of thinking harmonically and how he approached things. Uh, but I think that those underlying things that we were talking about earlier, about cleanliness and, and contrast and continuity and some of those points, I think those are not something that's just, oh, that's only important because I want to play traditional theater organ or that style. Um, no differently than, you know, if I hear Glenn playing the accompanimental part of the Lady Gaga thing that he plays. I think that's terrific, you know, and I'm hearing just those notes. I'm not hearing a bunch of slop around it most of the time. Watch those edges. And, you know, whether it's going, you know, bum, bum, dee, da, 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 I, I still want to, I want to know where the, where the timing is. I mean, my Lord, if you want to see about good timing, watch any, you know, modern music video. Because once you've got, you've got, you know, percussion tracks going and you've got dancers working along with whoever the performer is, you better believe that they know exactly where one and two and three and four are because that's where every move goes. Uh, the, the rhythmic precision is, is probably the most accurate of, of anything in that. So we, had a set, we have a second example, a printed uh, example. And, but just before we get into it, oh good, where's Jonas? Oh, Jonas isn't here. Well, oh, there's my stand-in. At this point, you're supposed to say, don't forget about, because <laughs> I will. Jonas had asked if, if I would make mention a little bit or just show you a, maybe a little demonstration of the difference in being in this kind of an environment in an in-theater installation as opposed to, I mean, the, the music studio, you know, out at the Phillips is like 5.1 surround sound. I mean, you know, there's, I got seven chambers, you know, four on one end and three on the other. And so that, that kind of takes it to the extreme. This is the much more normal for a larger size theater. Now, this theater's not big in number of seats, but you all are aware, I hope, that just to kind of know a little bit of uh, what came before history accurately, this kind of a theater would never have had an instrument like this in it in a million years. I mean, this is three times the size of what normally would have been put in. This was a neighborhood size theater. It was, you know, Originally, what probably 11, 1,200 seats. And then after the redo, and they made it more comfortable. Uh, it's about what, 974 or 1004 or something, right around 1,000 now. So it would have been a much smaller instrument, but it was not unusual. Did I do that? Yeah. It was not unusual to to have two sides. Not every theater did. A lot of them were only in one. If it was a small organ, sometimes it was in one chamber. Sometimes it was in a single chamber way up over the proscenium arch. Um, but, but this was not unusual at all, even starting at like eight rank organs, 10 rank organs, sometimes there'd be four and four or five and five, or there were some of them that were five and three uh, divided. And so what, what does that do other than fill the room up from both sides? Well, it gives you the opportunity to explore with, with the way things are, are registered, with the way you pick out, of doing some experimenting, and, and it does not have to be, I don't mean like all the time, I think it could be really limiting and you could get into some real narrow uh, strictures of thinking, okay, I always have to use these 15 ranks with each other over here and I always have to use these 15 or 16 over here, and well, no, not most of the time for ensemble stuff, there's things that are mixed like this from everywhere. But you can do some interesting 
little things. If, if the style of the music is written as like a duet or a back and forth, you know, what they'll sometimes call question and answer in music form, you can do some, some nice things like that. There's a piece of music from uh, the original score of South Pacific, the musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein. And it's just a, it's a, it's an instrumental section and it has uh, uh, vocals to it. And it comes at a point when Miss Forbush, the nurse, and Emile, the wealthy French planter, have been kind of batting eyes at each other partway through the play and uh, thinking, you know, none of the backgrounds are right and, you know, oh, I mean, there's just all kinds of things involved in it. The end result, young people, is they like each other and they want to date. That's the nicest way I can put it. And each one of them is afraid to speak up and say, hey, I really like you. So they wrote this wonderful musical section. It's called Twin Soliloquies. And it's constantly back and forth between her and him. And the, the words add a lot to it, too. But it finally builds and builds and builds to where they get brave enough to actually, this was the 50s, they have a toast. <laughs> they finally click their glasses and look passionately into each other's eyes and it's wonderful. And you can tell exactly when that happens musically. <laughs> the what I decided to use as an experiment that for, that's a, one of those perfect cases where why would you have, why would you want something separated on each side? So. This is just one, one idea possibility of how something like that could work, if I can. great example where you can take advantage of how stuff is placed, where it's put, and make like a dialogue so that it's like something talking to each other. Um, but you notice too that when it got to that, after it got to the section where it kind of starts to build, where it's more ensemble stuff, then I try to, to build by keeping balance. I, I try not to have one side get, uh, you know, eight-tenths of the sound and the other. And part of that comes from 
the design of the organ. And that's something we're not getting into in this workshop. Uh, it's really interesting and it's something that's, that's been vitally interesting to me for a number of years now. Uh, I learned what makes them work. Uh, poor people like Tom Fazell have to put up with me because I actually know every little detail of every little gizmo inside that action. And the reason I learned it was one of the mentors I was talking about earlier was a firm believer then that if you're going to play it, you ought to know how it's built only for self-defense. Nowadays, you, you guys have it a lot easier. There's a lot more instruments around. There's a lot of good people taking care of them. They're uh, in many of the places they're kept in wonderful condition. You know, stuff works. Um, when I started playing, I would get to a theater like this that maybe had a, a smaller Wurlitzer in it, and it turned on and the blower worked, and if you pressed keys, you, you made notes, and if you pushed pistons, some things would move. And maybe the last time anything had been really gone through was 15 or 20 years earlier, or in some cases, you gotta remember, if I was playing organs in 1965, they maybe were still original from 1929 or 31. If it's, if it's not a bad weather area, leather and stuff will last that long. So I became, first of all, I mean, I, I learned it first of all because I was told to, but then it became interesting to me from the standpoint of a, being a player of, I don't necessarily think of, oh, there's a red and white and red and white. I also think with my ears of, this is if I had a baton, okay? If I want to do that, what do I want to hear from that section and that section and that section? And I started noticing that certain instruments I went to gave me back a lot more. Okay, if, if it's gonna take seven hours of preparation or 17 weeks of preparation for a certain piece, um, I know Mr. Eddington knows this quite well, it makes that work worthwhile when you're hearing back exactly what you want it to give to you. You know, you're not fighting. It's not like running uphill with a cement bag on your back. And so then I started getting a lot more interested in the re then why. It's that wonderful old question. Okay, if this one's really neat to play and really rewarding and that one feels like work, why? And then that started getting into how things were laid out and how things worked together tonally. What came from where? What gave a good balance of, of what I wanted to hear to fill all this space up? And so like I, now that I said we're not going to get into that this time, but it is a whole huge another another area, but um, maybe sometime. Kind of as a little overview again of um, the things about color and contrast and continuity, uh, a little bit about arranging, a little bit about the idea of look, where does a pedal note go, where does the, the inversion position of a chord go to want to keep you wanting to keep moving forward, you know, and hearing something. Uh, I'm going to run through the it's just the one chorus of Gene and Mia uh, that you have in your book. Uh, this is a good idea about uh, the introduction, the main section of the song, and this also includes the verse and then into the chorus. A couple of people had specifically written down two things. What are the ideas for an introduction? You know, what are you going to use? And somebody else specifically wrote down, and what about uh, endings? You know, when you get up to a certain point, how do you end something? Well, the simple answer is you can just quit. That's usually not the most interesting way to do it. You want to have some sort of a little uh, flourish or a punk, think of it as a punctuation mark. However, you also don't want to fall in the trap of thinking that there's only two ways to end a piece of music. If it's been a pretty kind of lyrical ballad type thing, it can get to the last chord and as you release it, you can play a a broken arpeggio on the vibra harp. It's very pretty, but if you do that at the end of absolutely everything you play, they've already heard it. You know, it gets kind of old. Or if it's been an up-tempo piece and it gets to be the very last part of the chord and right before you let it go of the chord, you're already playing louder than Hades, and so then you can try to play a little louder, and then as you let go of it, hit a crash cymbal. Once again, it'll work, <laughs> but you might, there might be some alternatives to that along the way. One of the ideas about where to come up with an idea for an introduction. Okay, we saw in the Crawford thing, he used a quote from a whole different piece of music, but that had something to do with Russia and, and the whole feel of it. This one is a much easier way to do because this is right out of the piece itself. Uh, I modified it harmonically and 
and that it didn't go very far. But towards the end of the chorus of Giannina Mia, uh, the piece of music goes like this. Uh, uh, That's how the piece is written. Well, to me, it was kind of logical to come up with something for an introduction. I use the quote from the end, but I do it because it's not going to go right into the verse. That would be a little bit obvious, because it's coming right out of where it was written for. And all I've done is gone cut and paste and put that at the beginning. So instead, I'm going to use that little quote from the end, the bum, 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 bum. But it's, I really can't sing. It's going to instead go to what I call a surprise. My friend Ashley Miller, Ashley Miller was a wonderful musician, organist, uh, uh, arranger, band arranger, back on the East Coast. And I always loved having Ashley hear something I did because he knew the technical names, like kind of the Juilliard names for devices that I'd never heard of. I, to me, it was an instinctive thing. And so I would think, oh, well, that works there. And Ashley would, Ashley smoked a pipe like 23 hours a day. And I would do one of those things, and Ashley would go, hmm, unexpected cadence, hmm, deceptive harmony. <laughs> and it was, had this wonderful descriptions for everything. So there's an effect in the introduction of this that I don't know the Juilliard term for it. I call it the oops, maybe somebody's at the door feeling. So it's this. <laughs> Bum, bum, bum. Excerpting that from the end part of the song makes a, a wonderful little introduction for that. You can often find uh, a quote near the end like that that works really well. And if you're going to go right into the main body of the song, right into the chorus of it, then maybe look for a little musical quote even from the verse. Uh, 
sometimes there's something from that that you can, you can take out. It doesn't always have to be right from the same song, but it's a great source, usually here, there, all peppered throughout, of a lot of places that you can get an idea from and something that can be used. Um, and you notice the piece ended without a vibra harp or a crash cymbal. So they don't always have to be there. Yes? That to me is what I'm church organist this first with theater. I mean, I've been, I enjoyed listening, but that's what I do with a hymn. You know, you look at the music, okay, here's the last two bars. I'm going to pick that as my intro. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll start with something from the chorus and then go back. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for years and years, you probably know, and any of you who I know, some of you also, uh, play both and, and fill in in churches. Uh, we used to call it the, the standard Methodist vamp was you didn't do any creative. Well, the worst of all was to sit down and play all 16 measures of the hymn absolutely with the four parts that were written in the hymnal. Whoever made hymnals up, God bless them, uh, <laughs> really didn't go real creative. It's pretty basic. And, and there, was a, there was one thought years ago that, you know, the Lord doesn't like any doesn't like fancy. Well, I played 11 years in a church, and in my church, God liked fancy. <laughs> and the, you know, so it, creativity comes. You know, I won't get all spiritual on you, but creativity, whether it's a rose bush, or a rainbow, or music, it's got to come from somewhere. Fill in the blank. Uh, but then it was the thing of well, part of it is very practical in in church playing. You you're wanting. All these people, you know, you know that, that Tom doesn't sing very well, so you want him to hear the, the tempo and to be reminded what the hymn is. And so you're establishing all of that by using the end. But like you say, sometimes if it's a multi-structured hymn, some of them where they have more of a, of a verse chorus type of thing, yeah, you can, you can extract something out of that. And it's the same thing with, with light music. Oh, the oop, someone's at the door. Well, it, it's a happy birthday. It's back to the happy birthday effect. Is this done? <laughs> That's my real introduction for it. I didn't write out the clarinet thing. When it lets go of that F minor sixth chord, it's, a, it's, a, it's on a D pedal, so that's, it's not resolved there. And you, you know, even if you don't know what's coming up, the average ear would know, oh, wait, what? I'm left hanging. And then there's this weird little clarinet thing. What's he going to do? And then it finally gets into the piece. It's another one of those little devices of wanting to build some curiosity. I want you to wonder where it's going to go. Drama. Huh? Dr drama. Absolutely. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. If... <laughs> I have never in 42 years been accused of not being dramatic enough. <laughs> so yeah, I happen to like drama and music. I, I think that's part of what makes it rich and what makes it enjoyable. And uh, we recently had an event and uh, Mr. Rankin was with us and I loved watching about 300 people listen, you know, get a little goose bumpy with this huge big crescendoing timpani roll and then the A minor downbeat of what for all the world classical listeners realize, oh, they're going to play the Greek con the A minor concerto and uh, Mr. Eddington was flailing away on the introduction and the whole darn thing turned into Tico Tico <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> I'm here to tell you it worked spectacularly, but that's another one of those places to just watch that crescendo and the downbeat of that chord. You know something's coming. You don't know necessarily what, <laughs> but they're not all done. That was not a you know, three and a half second piece. So it's another version of, of gee, what's going to happen next? That is just another little example of all of those same elements that, that we were talking about. Uh, questions so far with anything that has to do with uh, registration, arranging, tempo, uh, with, with the style of what I've been doing so far today, which as I said is, is, in a, is in a very certain era, a certain sound, a certain kind of registration. Um, I've, I could just as easily hear somebody else 
approach. totally different sound and same piece of music and there's you know four people in this room that could do that better than me um, it just depends on on what appeals to you you know it's interesting how how some people friends who are your age who are studying they don't want to hear uh, they don't want to hear even as new as uh, Vierne or Vidor or Dupre, uh, you know, late, late uh, 1900s, early 20th century, like French composers, which I think is very thrilling. Um, they're intensely interested in what's exactly the right trill fingering, you know, in this harpsichord piece that was written in 1610. Um, that's something that I don't think anybody can ever explain. You know, why, why does you go in the place, Katie, you know, why do you want peach pie and he wants a donut? You know, who knows? It's, you know, it's just strictly personal taste and, you know, whatever we gravitate to. I have no idea. But, um... He got the donut thing right. <laughs> one of the things that uh, Jonas and I were talking the other night and uh, that I wanted to mention, though, in this, and that is that, um... Why, why do I think that it's even important to, to hear like a couple of these written out things or, or to try to learn something written out in like original traditional style? It doesn't mean that that's how everything needs to be played and it doesn't mean that that's the only way to approach it. But in kind of almost every other musical tradition, there's at least a, a respect for the earlier forms of an instrument um, and the the music that it started out on uh, I've been to a number of classical organ programs where the main body of the program might be 20th century modern composers uh, these are people trying something very different different sounds and and totally different compositional style. I'll admit much of it goes over my head, but that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It's just that I'm not apparently tuned into that. But usually within that program too, at the early part of the program, there will oftentimes be a Bach prelude and fugue. Now, does that mean that everybody that plays classical organ has to try to play exactly like Johann Sebastian Bach? No. But it does, I think, give a little bit of a nod of respect to how is something, how did something start, and then how was it built on? What can it go on and expand into? Um, I, I read all of your, your uh, sheets that you mailed in beforehand uh, with the little comment sections and what your interests were and, and all of that. Um, and one of them, was an interesting comment, and I certainly understand it uh, to a great degree. And that is that I'll be the first person to tell you that in, I think it was 1998, uh, when George Wright died, he died. He was an incredibly creative human being. Uh, he did an awful lot to advance this kind of instrument, it, it, I'm convinced, if it wasn't for the combination of his inventiveness coupled with a good sounding organ and a recording company in the mid-50s that took advantage of new hi-fi technology and everything, 
uh, it really brought that kind of sound back to a lot of people. And, and it really uh, kind of cemented it, created an enormous amount of interest. So I don't think that that's the end all and be all. No more than, than uh, Crawford had a wonderful recording career in the 1920s, uh, had a number of million selling 78 records. And that was a pretty big accomplishment. When you think back to the day, you didn't get to download anything. You had to, to sometimes walk to the bigger city next to you that had a big enough record store to hand them your money and buy a 78 and walk back home and play it on your acoustic phonograph. And so the idea of something selling a million copies uh, in that time was pretty staggering. Uh, and, that, and that happened for Crawford's stuff too. But with what theater organ can do, I, I do think that there's a spot to regard the starting point of it and then certainly go on to anything else from that. In other words, I don't want, I won't even say I don't want each of you, I don't want any of you necessarily. When you're coming up with ideas and playing, I don't want you to try to be George Wright. But I would hope that you would, along the way with developing, have both an appreciation and kind of a respect for the history that that sort of form is what started out happening, that really kind of got this sound and this instrument in front of people. And then use that as a point of departure. I mean, um, I, I can't tell you how many, I mentioned to somebody uh, early, just at, at lunch, I sat in a chair recently in a, in a wonderful room surrounded by gorgeous music and got to listen to a, what could be the most simple little Stephen Sondheim melody from a 1964 show he did called Anyone Can Whistle. And it's a, not a complex melody, it's very simple. And I sat there and listened to it put together by an arranging mind that took this and surrounded it with the most gorgeous textures and harmonies and wonderful quotations from slow section of a Rachmaninoff piano piece and it just all dovetailed like that. You would think, well of course that goes right there. It was it was must have been how it was written. No it wasn't. That was all from a creative mind. It had nothing to do with Crawford. It had nothing to do with George Wright. Or did it? It didn't in the sound and the arranging of the notes, but in the musicality, in the attention to how the line phrased, you know, where how a musical line moves, how the notes go, and when you let go of it. You know, there's the air is very important. And that came out and absolutely just about put me on the floor only because of the combination of how beautifully it was done, but the, the arranging thinking behind it. Um, I, I was just absolutely blown away. And I love being in a spot where that can happen, where you can hear something that you go, you know, the end effect afterwards is, oh my God, how could, how could a person have thought of that? Or how could they have created that, you know, so that I could experience that? So those same ideas of cleanliness and, and you know, being careful to the approach and having color, uh, it, it can be applied in lots of different ways. But one thing that I do hope, and, and not many people will do it, and that's absolutely fine, as long as a few people come along every now and then. By the same fact that people, of course Bach wrote all of his stuff down and so you can go learn a prelude and fugue if you, want, if you just take the time and do it. An awful lot of the early material for this instrument uh, wasn't written down in black and white and in print. And it takes a talent to transcribe. Speaking at lunch a little bit about listening and writing down, uh, just oral transcription of, of okay, that's there. It's a, it's a talent to learn how to identify what you're hearing and, and separate things apart. But as long as some of the stuff is written out, I think that it is good that a few people in each generation do still learn at least a couple of the accurate arrangements that Crawford did because they're extremely musical. 
and even a couple of the arrangements that George Wright did. He was a master arranger. He, he never needed to touch an organ. If he would have just written that same stuff out, those same ideas, and had a, an 18 or 20 piece band do it, it would have been just as creative and just as exciting. It's just that he chose that as the vehicle to use for it. Um, but that keeps that thread of the tradition alive. So that's, that's why I'm kind of the lone little voice in the woods that says, you know, I really hope that not everybody in the world forgets all that stuff forever, because it would be a shame to, to have it all gone.